Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you very much for joining us at this BIA discussion of the new government and what it means for our sector. We had planned to do this webinar last week, uh, but had to postpone it following the sad death of the Queen. So thank you everyone for understanding the need to reschedule and being flexible. Uh, joining me today, we have a great panel of speakers. Uh, Lisa Timothy is the Director of External Affairs for Takeda in the UK and Ireland, uh, with nearly 20 years of experience, both uh, in-house and in agency. Uh, Lisa was previously at MSD, where she was the Director of Policy Communications and Government Relations, and before that was at uh, Lexington. Uh, Lisa will be demonstrating her commitment to government affairs by spending her next birthday, a very significant one, at the Conservative Party conference. Audrey Evano is the head of uh, UK corporate government affairs for GSK, where she leads on the life sciences agenda, and she's the co-chair of the life sciences council, life sciences council's business environment board. Uh, she has form on life science policy making, uh, having previously helped shape the life science industrial strategy while she was at the uh, Neighbours, the ABPI. Uh, she also had the fun of the Brexit referendum and its aftermath. And before joining our sector, she worked in outsourcing education and political consultancy. John McTurnan is a senior advisor at uh, BCW, and he's a renowned prime minister whisperer, having advised prime ministers in seven countries. Uh, and he specializes in communications and policy development. Uh, he was Tony Blair's director of political operations and has also worked in the departments of work and pensions, defense uh, and Scotland during the Labour government. Uh, and he's also worked as director of communications for the Australian prime minister, Julia Gillard. Uh, John appears very often in the media, both old and new, and as well as seeing him uh, in print or broadcast outlets, uh, you'll find him uh, on social media and he gives excellent blog. Uh, so a quick fire question to our panel. Um, after this extraordinary few weeks, um, how would you sum up the mood in Westminster? Uh, Lisa, let's start with you. Hi there and thanks Nikki. Um, so obviously it's been a very unusual start for the for the new government and really everything has almost been on a bit of a pause but I think what I hear and see is is certainly a, a degree of anticipation expectation um, about what might come from the new government but I think also a heavy dose of trepidation um, about what is you know in the intray of that come incoming government and the situation that they're facing and potentially a little bit of weariness of where we are I think, in the election cycle as well. Thanks. Audrey, what's your sense of the mood? Thanks, Nikki. Yes, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I completely agree with Lee. Uh, there's, there's sort of different groups at Westminster with, that will be feeling differently about things at this time. You, you are either team trust and you share her beliefs and her values and, and how she's approaching certainly the economic question. Uh, a larger group of Conservative backbenchers are obviously out in the cold, um, not necessarily full-throated in their support, but essentially stuck with this until the election. You can't start splitting at this point. Um, and actually, I think if you're on the Labour backbenches, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, appreciation, shall we say, for the, the clear ideological uh, path now to the centre ground for them, uh, which, which is more, more cheering, I would say. Thanks. And John, what's your take? Uh, John's camera and microphone appear to be having a moment, so uh, we will give him a chance to switch himself on. What you see um, with, uh, is a government seeking to define itself by clear blue water between itself and the opposition, which, as Audrey said, does create an opportunity for the Labour Party to far more easily move back to the centre ground, which has wanted to since the Corbyn years. Um, you also see a government that's looking for definition through its actions, clarity, simplicity and momentum. Uh, and that is giving, I think, the opposition a sense that in a way they're spoiled for choice in terms of what attack lines they want. Is it bringing back fracking? Is that going to be an attack line? Is it cutting, you know, cutting taxes for the richest? Is it that it's going to be um, deregulation of free ports? Is it it's going to be um, uh, lifting the capital bankers bonuses or is it 
the old fashioned um, labor, you know, labor attacks on the NHS, or is it the a newfound weakness in the Tory party, crime and law and order? So you've got clear definition emerging between the, both the parties. Um, and you're going to see, I think, uh, a loss of the conflict Prime Minister's questions, because clearly Boris Johnson and um, uh, Keir Starmer personally disliked each other. There's going to be more difference over ideology than difference over character. Thank you. Uh, now, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please put your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, and during the course of the webinar, you get the chance to upvote uh, any question uh, when somebody has uh, said exactly what you're about to ask yourself any better. Um, and we will uh, have a decent amount of time for questions at the end. Um, and if we don't get round to everything, we will try and follow up after the webinar. Next slide, please. So it has been, um, as we mentioned, an extraordinary uh, period. And the three years of Boris Johnson's uh, premiership came to a rather sticky end um, on July the 7th, which actually feels like years ago now, but wasn't. Um, Boris had survived a lot of scandals and crises, um, including, uh, but as lawyers would say, not limited to, uh, Dominic Cummings' trip to uh, Barnard Castle to test his eyesight during the first lockdown. Obviously, he should have got spec savers. Uh, too many COVID rule-breaking parties uh, to count, uh, including most notoriously the party at number 10 in Downing Street the night before uh, Prince Philip's funeral, at which um, Her Late Majesty was pictured sitting uh, in solitary uh, state uh, observing the rules which other people had flouted. Uh, there was lying to Parliament about the parties, uh, wallpaper gate, uh, the uh, extremely um, spendy Lulu Little 900 and something pounds per roll decoration of uh, number 10, which turned out not to be the best uh, long term investment. Um, the uh, Neil Parrish's strange predilection. Uh, for tractors, which gave me all sorts of trouble when I was trying to Google image search uh, that issue. Um, Boris had survived a vote of uh, no confidence um, and his own uh, brush with death from COVID. Uh, but the last straw that broke the patience of the parliamentary uh, party was um, Chris Pincher by name uh, and the allegations of improper behaviour by a senior member of the WHIPS team uh, and led to a torrent of ministerial uh, and other resignations uh, that pitched uh, Boris over the edge. Next slide please. So after that uh, final and rather begrudging admission uh, that the game was up, um, there then were two months after Johnson's resignation in which the normal business of government was effectively put on hold for the Conservative Party's leadership contest because that's the way of things. It's not a prime minister uh, that gets chosen, it's a party leader. Um, there were a series of secret ballots in which the Tory MPs whittled down uh, the eight candidates who actually managed to scrape up a nomination or two uh, to the final runoff between Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, who then spent the summer uh, attacking each other uh, quite publicly for the benefit of the 160 odd thousand members of the Conservative Party who were the ones who had the final vote. And despite the um, preponderance of support in the Parliamentary Party for Rishi Sunak, uh, it became obvious that once it went out to the, uh, the party in the country, Liz Truss uh, was the runaway favourite. And that enabled her to spend the last stages of the contest hold up at Chevening, her grace and favour house, uh, with her aides and supporters, planning not just who to appoint to her cabinet and government, but also the first hundred days in office, which is uh, for those avid watchers of the West Wing and other uh, political junkies will know is an absolutely totemic uh, target you have to hit. First hundred days, a blitzkrieg of announcements and policies and, and moves that will leave the opposition uh, spinning on its heels. Uh, so Liz Truss's victory, to no one's surprise, was then announced uh, by Sir Graham Brady of the 1922 uh, Committee on the 5th of September. Next slide, please. 
So as I've said, Liz Truss arrived in number 10 with a very well-worked plan for her first 100 days and a raft of big policy announcements that were to come. Uh, and the sequencing had been hit the ground running, start getting big policy announcements out. Uh, but as the saying goes, man or woman plans and God laughs. Um, on uh, day one, uh, she flew up to Balmoral uh, for an audience with the Queen, who performed her final act of duty uh, and invited Liz Truss to form a government. Uh, by day three, she was in the middle of a debate on the energy crisis, uh, when uh, we will, I think, all have been slightly what on earth is going on here, as we saw Nadine Zahawi um, come up to her on the front bench and give her the news, as it turned mm -hmm. out, of the Queen's impending death. Uh, and by day four, she was having her first audience with King Charles III. And following that uh, very sad event, all plans and politics were put on hold for the 10 days of mourning uh, and preparations for this Monday's state funeral, which in another extraordinary turn of events for a new prime minister brought most of the world leaders uh, to London uh, onto her doorstep. Next slide, please. But of course, the world hasn't stood still during the leadership contest or the period of mourning. Uh, the war in Ukraine, the energy crisis, inflation, the cost of living and the cost of doing business crisis, strikes and the NHS uh, brought to its knees by COVID and now facing a winter meltdown. And of course, the unresolved issues of Brexit all demand attention. So, panel, that's quite the intro. Uh, what do you make of the prospects for the new government? And let's start with Audrey. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, as you say, uh, quite, quite the intro, but to be fair, I don't think any government over the last few years has had an easy time. Uh, what I would say is this government also faces a time crunch that is, is pretty significant. They have two years to deliver and then try to persuade the British public to, to elect them again. Um, and I think there are, yes, these, these sort of specific crises, but there is also an overriding challenge that are the more strategic and long-term level, which is, and uh, I don't know, it, pe people on the webinar may have read this, it was a Danny Finkelstein article in yesterday's Times I thought was very good, as they all are, but uh, really commenting on the, the dichotomy between the economics of Brexit and the culture of Brexit. And Liz Truss is going for the economics of Brexit. You are out of the single market. What's your offer to the world? It's the low tax regulatory reform, Singapore on Thames, as it used to be used to be referred to uh, model. That's not going to address the concerns of the left behind, those who didn't benefit from globalisation and who really drove a lot of that Brexit vote. So I think they have a very significant challenge on their hands to to keep their voters whilst delivering this kind of economic agenda, which really is at the heart of, uh, frankly, the future of the Conservative Party uh, more generally. So uh, yes, I think it's, it's huge. Uh, on the other hand, if we are a bit more positive, I think it's very interesting to see, um, as I think John was saying earlier, you know, a very, very, some very clear lines, clear definition. This is somebody who knows what she wants power to do. And we haven't had that for a long time either. And she can paint this as a new, fresh government. So there are a couple of things probably slightly undervalued at the moment, I would say. Thanks. John, you wouldn't wish this on your worst enemy, would you? Uh, oh, I would. Um, <laughs> I think this is, put aside everything, um, this is a fourth, it's a fourth term Tory government looking for a fifth term. And that has a reality to it, which is the no, no, it, it, never in the democratic era has a government, uh, a party had five terms in a row. Government exhausts you, government exhausts your personnel, the, the, the requirement of getting new um, cabinet ministers, new ideas, it's very hard to generate new ideas in government. Um, and so I think in that sense, um, we're working, there's a way in which this is the end game um, and the attempt to change the leadership uh, there was an attempt there to say it's a, you know Boris Johnson uh, led one type of government. This is something different. Uh, we're a fresh administration with the, the first trust administration, not the not the not the, not, not um, in a long line of Tory governments. The difficulty with this trust is she's been at the cabinet table for such a long time. 
the things she's solving, there's always the question, why didn't, why did you let this happen when you were uh, in the cabinet? Why didn't you stop this happening when you were in the cabinet? And so I think the, this is a, this ideological divide is going to be fruitful. It's very difficult for the government to give itself a freshness. Um, their greatest strength, in my view, is Liz Truss says things very clearly, very simply. The danger, uh, the trap that um, uh, Rishi Sunak fell into is that he implied that because Liz Truss said simple things, she must be a simpleton. And that kind of the mansplaining uh, and the misogyny, that, that hurt him really badly. And I think there's a danger there for Keir Starmer and for the Labour Party to fall into that. But I think this is definitely the, an opposition spoil for choice and a government, which if it dealt, if it, you know, if it dealt with everything uh, on that, they still have education catch up from the pandemic. They still have, um, they still have Brexit itself. Uh, they still have crime. Uh, they, you know, they can't, you can't keep young women safe from sexual uh, predators and you can't keep young men safe from being knifed and you can't keep uh, the older middle-aged and older people safe from cybercrime in their, uh, in their homes. What use are the police? So that, that are, there's so many things, Sergio, you, you deal with all this, another six things come into your into your entry. And that's why I think um, this is a this is a, a, a government that's going to extend till the latest date possible for election uh, and try to get the benefit of the doubt for its heart being in the right place. Thanks. Lisa, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with um, people on the line. I think, you know, it's a, it's a huge entry <laughs> uh, in facing some really significant burning issues. And of course, they've got this sort of condensed window in which to make an impact. So understandably, they're going to be focused very much on delivery and, and outcomes ahead of an election. I think, I guess my point would be that that, that offers a window, I guess, for industry in terms of how we need to show up. You know, they're going to be looking for people that are you know, productive partners that come with solutions to tackle some or help tackle some of these big issues. Um, so they're going to be looking for, you know, well packaged, high impact um, ideas that align with their priorities. So I think that's something to keep in mind in terms of our engagement going forward. Thank you. Next slide, please. So the top team, um, as we know, was pretty well formed uh, before uh, Trust took office. Um, it is not a broad church approach that she's taken. Uh, and I suppose it's not surprising, given that the contest with Rishi Sunak was so rancorous, uh, she was left the former chancellor's support of out in the cold in a pretty ruthless way. I mean, there was quite a lot of talk uh, before she became prime minister about the need to bring in all the disparate elements of the Conservative Party. Uh, that hasn't worked out well for previous prime ministers and she decided to stick uh, with people she knew and trust. And because the leadership contest uh, was a foregone conclusion, she's had the time to plan her appointments uh, and talk to people about um, what they would do on her key policy issues uh, of the economy and health. Um, and she's also got around her now a team of trusted political allies, uh, many of them South London neighbours of hers. So before we look in more detail at the key departments of interest to the BIA, I just wanted to get the, the panel's thoughts uh, on the top team, uh, the cabinet. Um, John, should we start with you? The interesting thing about the cabinet um, is they are they're going to present a united front politically because they're all signed up to what Liz Truss wants and that they are clearly pulling together in the center you've seen this uh in the cabinet office and in uh treasury and in number 10 a united a united approach and so it's it's really important to see the nexus there Jake Berry being appointed into the cabinet office is a pulling of leveling up away from uh, D luck and into the center. So, engagement with number 10 and the Treasury uh, and Cabinet Office is going to determine really whether the way that the industry wants to see uh, better regulation, what, what you might call right touch regulation, so not light touch, not lifting everything, but actually doing the things 
that can be done with the Brexit freedoms, the things which are the right thing to do, which enable us to be leading in the world, but also um, connected to the concerns that the, 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 the general public have. And so this, this top team, uh, it's new. Um, it's not been afraid to sack civil servants. That's what Kwasi Kwarteng did, shocked the civil service, I think, by sacking the um, head of the head of the treasury. And is now faced basically with appointing another person who was a senior head, treasury official who has the same view of the world. But the message has been sent, which is if you give us advice that says we can't do this, we'll probably sack you. Um, and that is probably going to have a chilling effect internally. And that will probably uh, lead to poor advice, because the best advice are ones that go, I get your objective, be thought of these objections. And this team feels as though they want the advice that they want, not the advice that helps them to do what they want. Thanks. Uh, Lisa, what do you think of the top team? Yeah, well, I, I agree with John. You know, you've got a, a group there, particularly in the closest levels of the cabinet that are are very closely aligned, uh, strong shared ideology amongst those leading cabinet members. And so that might make agreement easier. It might make them potentially more nimble um, when it comes to policy decisions, but it also you know, perhaps makes them less open to challenge um, and to rigor. So I think that's a watch out. We know they have a shared focus on growth, um, you know, shared desire to be, you know, this aspiration nation. Um, and I think, the, you know, an instinctiveness towards the kind of anti-nanny state, kind of pro the free market. And we've seen a, a few comments around that already around, you know, calorie counting in restaurants and getting rid of, of that and moving away from perhaps the obesity strategy. And I think that's something for us in the life sciences sector to think about and could potentially have implications. For, for us and the delivery of the life sciences vision and the missions within it. I also think it's potentially interesting looking at the advisors. Um, you know, we've seen a scaling back of the policy unit. Um, we've got a chief of staff who is a very experienced campaigner. And it's clear that, you know, this is a cabinet that's getting ready for an election as well. So I think that's that's quite some interesting moves, but I think behind the scenes and behind the cabinet as well. Thanks. And Audrey. Find my unmute button. Um, yes, I, I, I obviously obviously agree with the, the rest of the panel on that. I think um, the other thing that's important to note is the uh, the kitchen cabinet, if you, if you like, the, the the group that is closest. The, there's uh, talk of an economic quad, uh, taking us back to coalition uh, days terminology. Um, you know, so trust quartering. Simon Clark, the role of Simon Clark is going to be potentially it's potentially uh, not talked about enough at the moment um, as leveling up secretary. Um, potentially Kofi or, or Jacob Rees Mogg as as, as the fourth. Uh, um, is is really going to be driving that growth plan, putting everything through the lens of how does it help reach this new 2.5% ambition. I think what I find quite interesting is that we are seeing a willingness to um, slay the sacred cows um, and, and think differently, perhaps re-look at things that were discarded before. Uh, so as I think Lisa was saying, there are some opportunities there. There's always the risks on the downside that there is an unwillingness to listen to advice. It's a fine line. I can't remember who was writing this. It was during the leadership election, but there, there is a fine line, isn't there, between not accepting received wisdom and challenging that, and that can be a good thing. Uh, it can lead to fresh ideas, but it, but if you go too far and you assume that the advice you're getting is wrong or poorly motivated, um, that can lead you down some 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 poor paths, and I think links to the question that was being asked in the chat about uh, about regulation agenda, for example. Um, while I'm at it, uh, I might answer live that there was a question about Jacob Rees-Mogg, um, so I might just comment rather than trying to multitask. Um, I, I think obviously uh, somebody who believes in this affair, but but interestingly, I would just note, having from, come from the cabinet office, having had that interest in Brexit opportunities, I, I'm, you know, I don't think he'll be completely green to life sciences. So um, whether there will be a continued interest in the sector, we were mentioned once or twice, I think, in, in, on, on the Liz Trust side of the leadership campaign. So I think that's sort of, I would say, all to, all to fight for. Let's, you know, and I don't think any of us would be passive and, and, and sit back and wait, but I, I think it's a door wide open to us to, to go to him and, and, and put the case for the sector. 
thanks. And I love the fact that it has become unremarkable um, that the four holders of the great offices of state don't include a single white man amongst them. Um, and I'm sure Keir Starmer will be hearing a lot about the fact that uh, we're now on our third female Conservative Prime Minister um, and Labour may be accused of having a bit of catching up to do. Um, next slide, please. So the departments of keenest interest uh, to the BIA and our members um, are the Department of Health and Social Care, Business, Treasury and the Cabinet Office. Um, and we know that the cabinet level appointments have been made uh, for these departments, the junior ministerial ranks are being filled um, and the portfolios of responsibilities the junior ministers are being assigned. We do know that it's unlikely uh, that they will map exactly onto their predecessors. Uh, so um, the junior minister uh, in health uh, who focuses on life sciences will also have we gather probably more NHS uh, responsibility in their portfolio uh, than their predecessor. And I don't think we'll see uh, an exact replacement for George Freeman uh, as a science minister. We understand that he may well, or she may well be having to take on uh, responsibility for energy, which wasn't part of George's brief. Uh, and the panel have been thinking about these uh, crucial departments and what our industry um, can expect from them. So I'd like to start with uh, Lisa and business. Great, yes. So as we know, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg uh, was appointed the Secretary of State uh, for the Department for Business. And we know that his economic views largely echo those of um, trust, so, you know, seen as a champion of lower business taxes and free enterprise. And he's also been very vocal about growth, um, saying that he wants the department to be the department for growth. Whether we'll see a name change, I don't know, but um, that's that's something that's been you know widely widely reported. So I think it's fair to say that he would favour any forthcoming strategies that are really focused more on competition and market forces rather than perhaps a more government intervention interventionist approach. However, having said that, obviously the energy crisis has completely dominated his first his tenure in in the Department for Business, and he's just announced the energy bill relief scheme, which is obviously quite a significant government intervention in itself. Um, what more do we know about him? Well, we know he's a very strong Brexiteer. He's one of the most prominent and vocal Eurosceptics within the Conservative Party. And he's consistently supported quite rigid stances um, in the negotiations with the EU. And, you know, in line with trust as well, I think presumably quite sceptical of close regulatory alignment, um, I imagine, with the EU. And so that will quite, you know, be quite interesting and have implications, I guess, for our sector in how they might approach things like funding schemes for R&D. Um, I assume will favour, you know, UK separate funding um, for such schemes. Also has implications for the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, you know, again, has favoured quite a hard line approach when it's come to the, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and it will be interesting over the next few months to see how this situation rides out. You know, if we do end up triggering you know, Article 16, that's going to have significant implications for our sector and for the supply of medicines to Northern Ireland. So, again, I think it'd be interesting to see how much of that is, is rhetoric and how much actually they're going to you know, look to put into practice whilst in government. And then I think a little bit as Audrey mentioned, you know, how, how will he approach life sciences? And then, you know, he said very little around life sciences um, and a lot of his ministerial team are relatively new to the life sciences space as well. Um, I don't think we yet know who will have um, science in their, in their brief, but um, during the leadership election, you know, Trust did say that life sciences were at the heart of her vision um, for the future, for the country of the future. So that is a, a positive intent, echoes, I think, the last government talking about making the UK a science superpower. So that's really positive. I think there is just a, this question mark, though, about with so many competing priorities on their agenda, you know, how much headspace does Jacob Rees-Mogg and his department have to 
you know, really deliver the life sciences vision, really drive through on that momentum behind life sciences that was born out from um, the pandemic. And I think on this point, we can look at um, a report that came out last summer um, under Boris Johnson, but it was a, a report on the task force for innovation, growth and regulatory reform. Um, it was prepared by Ian Duncan Smith, Theresa Villiers and George Freeman. And it was looking at opportunities to, to identify and develop proposals that will drive innovation, growth and competitiveness. I think that offers a little window into where this government might look. Um, there's proposals in there around regulatory landscape for clinical trials. And so I think that could be an area of focus for this, for this government. Uh, and of course, it's positive for life sciences that we've got, you know, the former business secretary now in, in the treasury. And then I think just my final point on this, you know, we expect climate change to sit still within the Department for Business. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about the extent to which Jacob Rees-Mogg would be continue to embrace the current commitments around net zero and renewable energy policies. So I think there's very much a question mark on, on that one as well as to just how much that agenda will be pushed under this government. Great, thanks. Um, Audrey, what does the health department um, hold for you? Um, so my main takeaway has been that I'd be quite happy if I was the permanent secretary of the Department of Health. Um, I've got a new team. They don't really know health. They've not got fixed ideas of what they want to do. They've got, not got their own reform agenda. It's going to take them a while to get up to speed with what is a very challenging and complex brief. Um, so they're going to be pretty reliant on that advice. Quite interestingly, we were just talking about uh, the role of advisors here and, uh, and the civil service. Um, but, but essentially, you're going to have quite a lot of uh, guidance from the civil service as to where ministers should be focusing uh, and how they could be approaching things. So I think we're not going to see, um, how can I put it, any uh, particular challenge to the Department of Health institutional view of things for life sciences. Challenge will be on the NHS side of things. That is the overriding priority. They have so many fires to fight there. That's going to be the focus. Um, on the plus side, if you were the perm sec, oh, sorry, another plus, I suppose, you do have the, the deputy PM as well. So fighting your corner if you need it. That is something, Therese has the ear of the prime minister. If there's a real fight to be had across Westminster, she's gonna be in your corner and that, that can only be a good thing. So I'm seeing this as good for Department of Health institutionally, um, at least for now, um, and probably more probably more difficult, I think, for us to, to, to make headway on some of the more difficult issues the industry faces with with Department of Health um, because you are having to start again on familiarizing new ministers with those issues with the fact that there are different perspectives um, and the potential for different solutions uh, to, to those. Um, I think we see from today's announcement I have to confess I haven't had a chance to look at it in a lot of detail but the plan for patients from what was briefed out you know, is very much a sort of a, a tactical problem busting approach uh, rather than anything more fundamental, looking at the really long term challenges facing health and social care. I think we will see more of that. Um, thirdly, I think still unconfirmed exactly how the portfolios are going to play out. And I think there is a risk of some real fragmentation of the things that our sector would like to be viewed together um, around life sciences, the vision, the missions, but then how medicine's policy plays into the NHS as well as into the sector. Uh, where do vaccines lie in all of this? It, you know, is a big unanswered question. We also have the, the VTF, uh, uh, you know, was splitting up and going into its uh, constituent parts to OLS and HSA this month. It's really unclear what this government's vision uh, for vaccines, for pandemic preparedness is, and where does it feature on the priorities? What we're seeing is a very consumer facing agenda uh, in the ABCD priorities that we have. So um, obviously that sounds all a bit depressing, uh, to be honest, uh, it's probably the bit I'm a bit less optimistic about, but as ever, I think it just does make it incumbent on us as a sector to be really clear what the problem is, what we're bringing to the table, that, that is deliverable and doable and that we want to work on together. There's an old quote 
again, I, my memory is terrible these days, oh, obviously age showing, uh, but of a minister saying, you know, if I make a decision that impacts your business negatively and I didn't know about that impact, that's your fault, not mine. You have to tell me. Okay, it's a real pleasure to meet Audrey's inner Sir Humphrey. Um, she was channeling there. Um, John, I've, I've lumped Treasury and Cabinet Office together for you, uh, very different beasts. Yeah. So it'd be good to hear your thoughts on them. Yeah, I want to bridge from what Audrey was just saying. Um, and nobody should be worried uh, that the new Health Secretary doesn't have a reform agenda. There's not been a reform agenda from any politician since Andrew Lansley, and that was a terrible agenda. Um, the, the health policy was run by Simon Stevens when he was an advisor to Tony and when he was chief executive. So there's a, there's a funny situation, the balance of power in health is with the NHS, not with the department. Um, and you pointed out as well, Audrey, I think the, um, the, the tactical nature of the, 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 the plan responses um, from, from the, the, the health secretary. And I think it's useful to remember that the cabinet office has a former health minister, has a former vaccines minister, has somebody who doesn't need the industry to get them up to speed with a lot of the issues. And one of the things about, I think, uh, the relationship there is a lot of the things that the industry wants are the cross-departmental event in the end. Um, and that it, it may well be that the best person to engage with is going to be um, Nadim because he's up to speed with the issues. He's got a, a roving role. He's got a span across uh, the cabinet. And that tightness at the center between the cabinet office, uh, treasury and number 10, particularly with number 10 shifting some of its policy staff into the cabinet office, it may well be the combination of engagement with a, with a cabinet minister who understands some of the background, a cabinet minister who gets some of the background but is able to speak across, across the piece may, may be the most important thing. So it, it's, this, this, this continuous discussion isn't there about whether there should be a prime minister department. There isn't, but the three bits of the number 10 uh, treasury and cabinet office are intended clearly to work together to the central government initiatives. And I think it, there, are, there are places in the industry have questions about and concerns about and policy, policy demands, policy needs, policy observations. And I think it is going into that nexus and understanding what the what the what the cabinet office can do to make your case for you and how you tie that to get tie that back to the health department and, and, and base but the other the point that was made uh, I think lisa made it that uh, or maybe you you made it nikki the point that the science minister is probably going to have to cover energy tells you everything which is that the priorities will be the priorities the main thing will be the main thing uh, and that we have to find the right point to enter to make the arguments about the things that we want, which takes me to, tr to Treasury. Um, like one, of the, one of the biggest issues that the, the, the incoming governments have is they think they should need to do something about Treasury. The Treasury view uh, gets in the way. The Treasury view gets in the way for a very good reason, because if, and I've got a lot of sympathy with the Treasury, because I've seen in government and outside government so many spend day proposals, all of which, um i've got full commitment to the spending and vague on this on the saving and i think in this situation there's a space to there's, there's a place to go to which is um what is it the treasury want from our industry obviously it's part of the economic side of global britain it's part of the reality of we're making these changes in the tax system can we be can we be in some place in the face of that or the are there while they're talking about the deregulatory agenda can we get it right and so that the the, the getting a, a, a joint approach i think to treasury and capital take it seriously take seriously that the, the number 10 treasury and cabinet officer working in lockstep find the right route into the right ministerial champion but take a combined approach across the, across the board uh, and obviously make sure that health and, and base where necessary are aligned but i think the center is, 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 is going to be very powerful in this because if we go back to what we said about the, the characters, the politics, the ideology, the personal closeness uh, of, of, of this people at the centre uh, of the government. Thanks. And it's probably purely selfish uh, of the BIAs be quite as pleased as we are 
about Nadim and Kwasi in particular being appointed because they know us very well, they know our industry, they have been with us through the journey of the vaccines and also the uh, scale up finance work, which uh, Audrey is going to uh, talk about. So if we could have the next slide, please. Um, and I'd like uh, Audrey to uh, talk us through the um, history of government and industry partnerships that have uh, really delivered for us. So uh, please, Audrey. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so I think um, we're all quite aware, I think, of, of the VTF as, as a sort of leading example of this over the last two, three years, and, and really the pandemic pushing life sciences very much to the forefront of the, the nation's consciousness and certainly politicians' consciousness. Um, but it's worth just reflecting, I think, on uh, the various examples and really how that has supported the sector and what position it leaves us in now. Um, Nikki, you might also want to, to come in a bit more on the VTF, obviously, given BIA's involvement. I think there's almost a very simple point to make here, which is it shows what's possible when you bring business expertise right into the heart of what government's trying to deliver, where that is the most appropriate thing to do, of course, it's not, not always appropriate across the, the, the whole of government, but on this issue, that's what was needed. A new different model was adopted to, to deliver that and worked fantastically well. I think it's actually quite instructive if we look at it globally that it was the UK that took that approach you, you wouldn't have seen that in the EU I don't think um I don't think that's coincidence I think you talked about the history uh Nikki and the history actually of partnership goes much further back I think we have a very long standing and carefully curated over um quite some time community between the life sciences sector the various public bodies that work on this the office for life sciences i think is a really core institution that helps bring some of that to bring and hold some of that together along with i have to say and i'm not just uh, not not just because you're the hosts but i think our, our really strong trade bodies yourselves abpi do you know coalesce the sector in ways that enable that dialogue and and co-creation uh, between the sector and government um which brings us neatly on to, I think, the life sciences vision. Uh, as you noted at the beginning, I've, I've sort of seen a few iterations of this kind of thing, um, but it was, it was a very rapid and successful uh, effort to refresh the industrial strategy. Uh, it really showed how powerful the sector can be when we come together um, and that we work in this constructive and focused partnership. We had a clear goal, a clear, a clear deadline, which was rather motivating. Um, and OK, not everything will get agreed on, but there's a clear platform there, a clear shared ambition priorities, which I'll be honest, I think is a bit easy for our sector to take for granted because we've had something like that for a while. But actually, if you look across sectors and if you look across the work of government, that is um, not something everybody has, every sector has. And it really does help set us apart. If you are in government and you're trying to work with a sector, you need it united, well organised. You need it to be clear what it wants. Um, so I think we have uh, a really strong start in this sector and in the UK for that kind of co-creation with a, with a clear goal towards growth and, and to contribute to that growth plan. You know, that, that's the pitch essentially to government. Look what we've already done together and we're ready to work with you. We're, we're already there, guys. We're ready. Let's, let's roll. Let's go. Um, and what I love about the scale up task force is, is what a good example of that that is uh, and how it was really prompted and, and enabled by the vision so I, I see that as the first big deliverable that came out of the vision the vision was very clear that improving access to finance for our growing SMEs was a precondition for success that phrasing is not a coincidence that wasn't a sort of a, a structural device for the document that was absolutely core to what John Bell and John Simon saw as, as being important for, for the UK to be a world leading uh, life science power. Um, so we had great political and industry leadership from the offset, a really clear goal, let's look at this problem, let's gather the evidence, gather the perspectives, have the right people around the table and come to some fresh solutions. And I think the work of that team supported by the BIA, of course, um, was just really phenomenal. So I, I was sort of probably a bit of a spectator. It's not my expertise, but I, I was really blown away by the expertise that was put together and the, uh, the goodwill and the, and the effort that went into that. Um, I think really saw the fruits of that in Kwasi Kwarteng's very strong support for the recommendations of the task force. 
which really helped that uh, sort of get socialized as it were and start to work its way through the Whitehall machine. As John was saying earlier, these things are cross-governmental things that need, need wider approval. Um, and wonderful uh, that uh, our friend Quasi has now ended up at the Treasury. So we shall see he's in the perfect position to now implement his own recommendations <laughs> to the Treasury. Uh, so that, that leaves us in a, in a hopeful place um, but I think that is overall what I want to leave us with is, is um, an appreciation of our own efforts as a sector and our own unity. Uh, somebody asked a question in the chat about small and large companies. And actually, I've always been impressed by how much overlap there is in the agenda and the priorities of the small and large companies in this sector. Um, and if we can speak with one voice, that's going to be really powerful. Thank you, Audrey, and a really useful reminder that we are in many ways the envy of um, people who do our jobs in other industry sectors. And it was all that work that you uh, referenced during the um, previous industrial strategies that stood us in such good stead when the pandemic came along. The government had those relationships to hand. They could get people at speed around a table to find solutions. And it was I think one of the most productive periods, which we then saw the life sciences vision, those two months over a summer when we all sat in the darkened room with a towel around our heads, uh, is not something that is the normal pattern of, of government and industry exchange. So uh, thank you for reminding us of, of what it is that we've got. Can we have the next slide, please. Um, and I'd like to invite Lisa to talk a bit about the UK's attractiveness as a biotech and life sciences hub in a global context. Yeah, so we've talked obviously quite a bit today about in the UK and what we're doing here, but actually I think as Nikki just said, it's kind of taking that step back and what does it what does it actually look like? I think if you're you're not in the UK and you're sitting outside it, what you what you're thinking um, about the UK as as a as a landscape and how attractive it might be or, or might not be. And of course, on this call, you've heard quite a lot about the challenges facing government, and there are significant challenges. Some of those are unique in the sense to the UK, like the uh, pressure on the NHS. Others maybe not quite so unique, you know, the financial climate, high inflation. There's other markets facing facing that too, and there's significant, you know, financial and commercial pressures on the industry at the moment as we all know we all we've seen the vpas and the, the communications around that so undoubtedly this will impact how the uk environment is viewed in global boardrooms but i think you know speaking a little bit to audrey's point we've also heard you know some kind of positive pieces that we can really focus on you know heard about the government's focus on growth on being pro-business um on our sector having a plan, you know, we have a life sciences vision ready to go. Um, we also have the missions that are already set up and have people around the table discussing and collaborating. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we also have that task force on innovation, growth and regulatory reform. Again, there's, there's ideas and elements in there that, you know, if, if taken through, if delivered, could really impact the, the UK environment and how attractive it is. And I saw the question in the chat around, you know, VPAS um, and, and how this might align, you know, to the to the government and how we might talk about it. And I think I think this is where we have an opportunity, you know, for our sector to be positioned as that sector of of opportunity, of growth, of of aspiration. And I think when thinking about the VPAS negotiations, you know, that is something that we will need to think about how we're positioned. And I think that might be where the opportunity lies. And there's also opportunities, I know we've talked about clinical trials regime and you know, what we can, might be able to do there. There's a lot of unknowns currently around the regulatory system in terms of the MHRA on the world stage and exactly what that might look like in the future. So I think there's really an ecosystem from which the UK government can build um, and there's a willing cohort of industry, academia, you know, NHS people that want to come together and deliver it. So I think my my lasting comment would be you know we've got all the tools there we just need to turn that ambition and rhetoric into a reality thanks that's great may I have the next slide please uh, this is a crystal ball because I'm going to invite John to peer into the future um, and through the clouds darkly uh, tell us uh, what's going to be coming up
Well, the first thing to say is, obviously, with the, um, the hike in interest rates that the Bank of England have done today, interest rates have gone to 2.25%. For those of us like myself old enough to remember the 90s, uh, that seems still a small number compared to 15%. Um, it is 22 and a half times what it was at its lowest. So a 22 and a half time in 22 and a half times increase is a shock to any budgets, whatever you, however you're borrowing, however you're hedged. Um, and the knock-on onto um, mortgages is going to roll through the next two years. I fully anticipate this government is going to run uh, the government for as long as possible and look for a moment when the perfect moment for them is going to be when people believe you can see this, some green shoots of the current policies, but not, but you, cannot, you can't judge whether they've worked or not. You could say, you can argue, this looks like it's working, give us a mandate to carry on. So that's where they're going to be going to, which for me leads you to... Uh, September, October, 2024 for a general election. But you can't put, you can't put, you can't put the date January, 2025 fully away because if you're, you know, if you're, if you're running from the voters and scared of the voters are scared of, uh, you'll keep on hoping something will come up. So the, 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 the tension in the government now in the, in, is that to deal with inflation, the bank of England are raising interest rates. Many, many people are hedged with their interest rates by having fixed term, fixed term, fixed uh, rate mortgages. Everybody on a fixed rate mortgage is on a, is on a time. They come off it at some point and everybody's going to come off to a rate higher than they had before. Um, and that's going to make some of the energy price pressures, some of the cost of living pressures look small, given the amount of money you have to borrow to buy in this overheated housing market. So I think that is a slow, it's going to be a slow burn thing, but we're going to see that coming through month after month after month. The impact of the Bank of England trying to trying to deal with the inflation by raising interest rates. I think um, you're going to see you you do see uh, and you'll see in the fiscal event uh, on Friday two things. Um, what maybe three things? One's a desire to, to to use money to use government intervention to support consumers and businesses and communities. Um, two is a willingness to let uh, the, not to get that money in from taxes, but to let the, um, let the overall budget take the strain, take, let, let the deficit uh, like, and debt take the strain. The problem about that uh, is that it's not only the government that takes a view of the UK's economic performance, the international money markets do. Uh, and you can look on the pound as, it's the country's share price. At the moment, the pound, the dollar, um, is moving towards parity. That has huge implications. Just starting for, for it makes any company listed in the UK a very interesting target. Uh, there's lots of companies which are going to be at a historic low for buying, uh, for buying and breaking up. There's going to be all kinds of issues around that. That's just one another of the of the long term threads that's going to run through the next period. I think, in a way, the Northern Ireland Protocol is the easiest thing to solve because um, there is an obvious way through this. And uh, while it is a dispute between uh, the European Union and the UK around Brexit, the UK government and the European Union are guarantors of the peace treaty. You know, there was a war in Northern Ireland. There is peace in Northern Ireland. It was settled with a peace treaty. Two sides came together in that conflict, the Unionists and the Republicans. Um, guaranteed by the UK, guaranteed by Ireland, guaranteed by the EU, stood behind by the US. Um, it's a very big thing to to rip up a peace treaty. So I think there'll be a solution found on that, despite the despite the rhetoric on, on, on all sides. The PM and the her own party. She's not the most popular leader that the party has ever had amongst its parliamentary party. Um, and there's a tiny suspicion that had the um, the vote amongst in the party members in the country gone one or two weeks longer, she might have had a, a, a slimmer majority. Um, they'll judge her in the way they've judged all the previous um, uh, prime ministers. They're very unsentimental. Can you can you keep my seat? Can you win the next election? Um, can you keep my seat is more important than can you win the next election? Um, so, you know, this, the large majority of the Tories have got the inflated by the red wall, the, the seats held from Labour, picked up from Labour in 2019. 
The core of the Tory party are going to be looking at, well, my seat, which has always been Tory, stay Tory. Will Beckenham still be a Tory seat? Um, will the outer suburbs be still be, be uh, will Isha still have a Tory MP? Those kinds of questions are going to be the ones that drive them. Uh, you know, as Paul Keating, the, the Prime Minister of Australia, once said, um, bet on self-interest because it's always going to be the most motivated horse in the race. Um, so the, the PM will handle the Tories when it looks like she's got momentum and she's going somewhere with the country. Final thing, the country, what will they judge this on? They'll judge it on their lived experience. There'll be an NHS crisis, but most of us don't use the NHS from one year to the next. So that will have to be something that's quite big as a winter crisis to really punch through politically. Um, crime again, crime, uh, we're, you know, the police are failing, but they're failing only a small number of people. It'll have to be a symbolic thing like that, but like uh, Jamie Bulger's murder, something that actually resonates. Um, you know, what, what would happen uh, if the Sarah Everard case happened uh, this year? Different, because they, I think people's respect for the police has changed a lot, partly because of that case. Um, so, so I think crime is, what will happen if there's rioting? Cost of living uh, pressures could lead to rioting. Uh, uprisings. So that again, there's a lot going on which can which can fall one way or another. But I think in the end, uh, the the one thing the government must be working behind the scenes absolutely on is to make sure there's no energy rationing, which is the new word for power cuts. I think if there were power cuts, uh, that would be the end of the authority of the Conservatives uh, as a government, and it would just be they, they'd be they'd be well advised to have an early election um, to mitigate the losses rather than to to to, to keep it on. Next year is going to be a fascinating year. Um, there will there will still be inflation. Uh, it depends. We have to see how long it takes to cut work through the UK system. It's taken a long time in the past. Uh, again, if you're old enough as I am and been around in politics as long as I have, you can remember when inflation was the issue of politics. Uh, and it was solved partly by Margaret Thatcher, partly by the UK joining the European Union, but mainly by China joining the global market. The, the great moderation started when China became uh, an open trading capitalist nation. The geopolitical uh, conflict around China, if China moves out of the global economy, that may leave inflation as a sustained high thing. So there's lots of challenges uh, for, the, for, 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 for the next year. And I think to try to pull together some of the threads of what we've been saying, you can tell what the government want. They want they want to be pro-business. They believe that low tax and deregulation is, is the route to that, but they want that for a purpose and the purpose is growth. So anything, and it just as in the, in the previous Johnson administration, everything was couched in terms of leveling up and you tried to, in, to, to, to say what your policy asks were and how they fitted in that framework. I think the growth framework, the deregulation framework, bring it to life and there are things that the industry wants which makes sense for the industry, which makes sense for the country, and which makes sense for the government's agenda. And it's packaging them up. The best, the best policy decisions to offer to ministers to make are ones which are simple uh, to understand, which are easy to make, and which have very clear and swift consequences. So they're looking to move them from the quick wins, uh, the very simple things like uh, to, 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 to the slow burn things, which will have an impact in the next nine to 18 months. And if you can do that, I think you'll, you'll get a hearing and the industry, you know, it's a great British success story. And the final thing I'd add in all of this is um, cross-party cross -party support is going to become increasingly important because the civil service are well aware there may be a different government uh, coming in. Uh, and anything that's backed by both sides of the House is going to have uh, an easier passage. And I think that it's, it's always well to think you know, Parliament is made up of a lot more MPs than simply the government cabinet cabinet members. Thank you. Um, may we have the next slide, please? And I'm going to have to do some quick fire questions uh, that haven't been picked up already. And uh, we'll start with uh, Lisa, because you touched on the deregulation agenda. I wondered if you'd like to answer the question about the likely trajectory of the deregulation initiative. Uh, you've referenced Tigger already. How do you see that playing out? Hi there. So, sorry, which, which question are you looking at? Sorry. This is, I'm, I'm interested in the likely trajectory of the deregulation initiative. The changes emerging in UK regulatory systems have the potential to be transformative, but could be undermined by the crudely political language in this area. Yeah, so I see that John um, had a little answer at that as well. But I think, I think you know, as, as John said in his, his wrap up, I think 
this deregulatory agenda will gather momentum with this government and I think there will be you know real interest in in really pursuing this and so yeah, I mentioned that the Tigger report I think that is something that will be of attractive really attractive to this to this government and they will want to pursue that um I guess you know as you say there are trade-offs <laughs> you know there are there, there you know there are trade-offs when you look at this deregulation agenda um and you look at forming your own path in the regulatory agenda we talk about that in the MHRA you know really what might sound attractive on paper might not be quite so the case when it comes to in practice and particularly for the life sciences sector you know how far do we want the MHRA to go down that their own line and so I think bringing that case to pol politicians and parliamentarians to make it really clear you know what opportunities there are but equally what implications there are is, is going to be really important. Great, thank you very much and um, sadly we're out of time. I want to thank the panel, you have been great uh, for being so frank and insightful. Um, thank you to the audience for your questions, I hope uh, they've all been answered. Uh, we have the next slide, you will see that there are uh, more webinars coming up and, and other events from BIA, uh, all details on our website. Uh, but for now, thank you and goodbye.